Um, all right. Well, man, thank you guys so much. Um, I want to do something just a little bit different today. So what we're going to do this is a little bit different. Um, for those of you who make you feel like you get distracted easily, that is also me. Uh, I feel you. Try not to get distracted. Those of you who feel like you are great multitaskers, this is time to put that to the test. We're going to put a clock up on the screen. I know a lot of people are like, all right, preacher's actually preaching on the clock today. What up? Okay. No, we're going to put 30 minutes on the clock. We will come back to it. Okay. Just block it out. Pretend like it's not there. We'll come back to it. But we're going to put 30 minutes on the clock. I'll come back to that here in a little bit. So let's go ahead and start that time. But in the meantime, before we get back to that, let's get started. As Pastor Ryan said, we have been uh, talking about our uh, the book of Judges. We call this wrecking ball, how we can, you know, take a wrecking ball to the destructive patterns in our own life. And um, this morning, I want to talk about Deborah. Deborah is one of the judges in the book of Judges. Um, her story takes place in chapter four. It, it takes place, there's actually two chapters um, for, for, for Deborah in, in, in the book of Judges. Chapter 4 is like her story, and then chapter 5, she sings a song kind of celebrating the victory of it. And i got to tell you, uh, this is like one of the weirdest stories I've ever read. Like, I have spent a lot of time like reading the story this week, and I read like a, you know, a couple of different books and listened to a couple of different sermons, and everybody said something different. And that is never encouraging when you're a preacher getting up to preach and nobody has any idea what's going on, okay? So it's just kind of, it's just kind of funny. But the more I have studied this, I really feel like there are some really... Um, really timely, you know, profound um, uh, truths for us today. So let's just go ahead and look at Deborah's story. Um, we'll start with verse 4. This is Judges chapter 4, verse 4. It says, Now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. Okay, so she's, you know, we, we, we know, okay, her name's Deborah. She's a prophet, she's married to Lapidoth, and she's leading Israel, okay? Um, she sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali. Those are some of those great Bible words you never know what to do with. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, um, We'll pause right there for a second. If you know anything about the, you know, the period of the judges, the Israelites go through this cycle where they are, uh, they rebel against God. You know, they get they get in trouble. Uh, they cry out for help from God, and then the Lord delivers them. Those are who the judges are. They are the deliverers. They're the ones who through whom God delivers Israel. And so Jabin is the guy that is oppressing the Israelites here. Sisera is his commander. So uh, Deborah is telling Barak, you know, go do all this, and he, and she says, the Lord says, I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River. And give him into your hands. Now, when I said earlier, this is kind of an interesting story. This is what I meant. You know, we've already talked about a couple of different judges so far. We talked about, you know, the first week Pastor Ryan um, talked to us a lot about Samson. And one of the interesting things about Samson was, you know, Samson was anointed with this incredible strength, right? Like, it was easy to understand why Samson um, was so, you know, prominently featured throughout the whole book of Judges because he had this incredible strength. You know, his strength flowed out of his relationship with God. And so, you know, Samson used that um, oftentimes not for God, but then at the very end of his life, he used that for God. So we understood why Samson, you know, was such a prominent figure. You know, we, we've also talked about Gideon. Gideon, God called out to him. If you remember this a couple weeks ago, Pastor Ryan shared with us, God called out to him and called him mighty warrior, right? And, you know, and Gideon was like, who, me? You talking to me? You know, um, and, and Gideon, you know, was called out by God personally. And then not only that, but then God commanded Gideon, to lead Israel's army. And so Gideon leads into battle. But here, we look at these couple of verses. Deborah doesn't have great strength. It doesn't tell us anything about Deborah having great strength. Um, she's leading Israel's people, but she delegates leading the army to Barak, remember? Um, and, and in fact, we don't even really even see God talking to Deborah. We just see Deborah sort of speaking on behalf of God. We just kind of assume, okay, God talks to Deborah, and Deborah speaks for God. But I think that is why Deborah is featured as such a leader. See, Deborah reminds me, here's what I mean by that. Deborah reminds me of, of, of One Direction fans. You guys know who One Direction is, the little band? You guys know what I'm talking about? Okay. All right, this is an interesting story. Um, there is apparently, I don't, I, I'm not a fan of One Direction, okay, but... Um, <laughs> I feel, I feel like I need to, you know, start off on a good note with you guys, okay? Um, 
But something that I have learned, um, there is a guy in One Direction. Um, I think his name is Liam Payne. His last name is Payne. Okay, just like my, my last name is Payne, P-A-Y-N-E. Um, and Liam's dad, I kid you not, Liam's dad's name is Jeffrey Payne. Spells it the exact same way that I do. And so periodically throughout, you know, certain seasons of the year, I will get these people on Twitter and Instagram and whatever that follow me um, and thank me for my contribution to the world <laughs> because of Liam Payne. Um, like I have straight up, I, I, I'm not kidding you guys, on Australian Father's Day a few years ago, I had several of them um, hit me up on Instagram with a picture of Liam Payne. Thank you so much at Jeff Payne for your contribution to the world. And I'm like, no problem. Um, and so like, it's just really like, it's just, it's kind of a bizarre case of mistaken identity. Um, you know, uh, and the funny thing is, is when I come to church and I tweet about what Pastor Ryan's talking about, they always retweet it. It's really funny. Um, so, you know, maybe God is using me to minister to One Direction fans. Um, but here's the funny thing. Like, the more I dig into these, uh, they call themselves directioners. The more I dig into directioners, I, I come to find out this is true on, like, whichever platform it is. It's true on Twitter. It's true on, you know, Instagram. Um, these, most of these One Direction fans, most of the hardcore One Direction, there's a lot of weird stuff on the internet. Some of the weirdest stuff is One Direction fans, by the way. Um, like, all they do is just retweet stuff about One Direction. All they do is just repost stuff from Liam. You know, um, he's the only one in One Direction to know their names, so I don't know how many other guys there are, but they just repost their stuff. They just retweet their stuff. They use their social media platform really as just a second platform for One Direction. And that's what Deborah's doing here. Deborah's just sort of retweeting what she gets from God, right? Like she's just, you know, she's just sort of retweeting whatever it is she hears from the Lord. She's like a One Direction fan. Her platform, if you will, is just another platform for God. Spiritual leaders use the platform of their life, whether it was Gideon leading the armies, uh, whether it was Samson and his incredible strength. Now it's Deborah and her leadership as, as, as a prophet and the one who's leading Israel. They just use their the platform of their life for God. Now I, I can understand if maybe you feel like this doesn't apply to you, you know, you might be thinking, you know, Jeff, I don't really have a platform in my life, you know, or I don't, you know, I'm not, um, I, I don't feel like I have, you know, just a whole lot of leadership. Well, let's talk about that. See, the way that you live your life is your platform. How you choose to live your life is the platform of your life. So let's just unpack this for a second. Let's talk about, you know, something, you know, let, let, let's talk about, you know, work and family, right? Those are two pretty, you know, kind of you know, rough, you know, understand, roughly understandable, relatable, they, 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 they kind of, you know, compare across spectrums. Let's say you love your job, right? Let's say you have a fantastic job. Let's say, you know, you were all about your career. Then I would tell you, even if your job is fantastic, and I don't mean this in, a, you know, in an ugly or vindictive sense, the platform of your life is your job. The platform of your life is your career. If you were all about your job, that's the platform of your life, okay? If you love your kids, if you love your family, maybe you, you know, you're, you're not, you know, maybe you feel like, hey, I'm not going to be a deadbeat dad or I'm not going to be, you know, just kind of a loser spouse. I'm going to, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to be committed. I'm going to be devoted. I'm going to be intentional. When I show up, I'm not just there, but like I'm present, like mentally, emotionally, I'm there for my family. Hey, that's fantastic. I want you to know that's, I'm not telling you that's a bad thing, but I am telling you that the platform of your life, if that is what you are all about, um, whether you're married, whether you're single, whether you have kids, whether you don't maybe it's not even necessarily like blood family but it's friends who feel like family the platform of your life is then your family and I'm not telling you today you should feel bad about the platform of your life but if the platform of your life is not God if it is anything else other than God you are wasting your leadership potential see we can be just like Deborah if we're willing to be leaders who stand up and lead if we make the platform of our life all about God we can be leaders who lead we can be spiritual leaders in our life have you has anybody ever thought about that have you ever considered hey maybe I could be a spiritual leader I know that that you know sometimes we think oh you know spiritual leaders are pastors spiritual leaders are missionaries they're authors they're speakers and that's totally fine but the reason why those people are spiritual leaders is because they use the platform of their life for God, but you can be a spiritual leader too if you make the platform of your life all about God because you can have influence. Now, when I talk about influence, I don't mean, uh, well, let me tell you what I mean. Okay, there's this kind of this funny story. Uh, I hope you guys think it's funny. Uh, a couple of months ago, Pastor Brandon called me up and he was like, hey, Jeff, I need a favor. And like, you know, if you've ever had a friend call you and ask you for a favor, you always know there's like that 50-50 chance you shouldn't have picked up the phone, you know? Um, and so I'm like, all right, let's do this. So I'm like, Brandon, what, you know, what do you need, man? And he's like, Jeff, I, um, I found this scooter on Craigslist, I need you to go help me pick it up. And I'm like, 
are you kidding me? Um, and he was like, no, 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 man, it's going to be cool. And I was like, all right, you know, I mean, whatever, sure, let's do it. So I get in the car with Brandon, and we start driving out, um, you know, to go find the scooter. And he's just, like, telling me all about it on the way there. And he's like, yeah, man, it's 125 cc's, and I got it for this much. I went and checked it out last night, but I didn't have the cash on me. And blah, 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 blah. I mean, like, he is stoked. He's like, it gets 100 miles to the gallon. And I'm like, all right, that's cool. Like, this is a little weird. You know, you are a grown man trying to drive a scooter, but whatever. <laughs> um, and so, like, I'm like, all right, cool, man. So we go. Like, we pull up to this guy's house. Um, and he, like, is showing Brandon the scooter. And Brandon's like, yeah, man, I'll take it. Like, hands the guy the cash. The guy kind of thumbs through it, make sure he's not getting ripped off. And um, he's like, all right, man, here you go. And Brandon was like, hey, Jeff, take my picture. So, like, he kind of pulled up in the scooter, <laughs> pulled out my phone, took a picture, passed to Brandon. And he was like, all right, man, I want you to follow me home just to make sure I get home okay. I was like, yeah, not a problem. And I was driving his car. He was driving the scooter. We had to get both uh, vehicles, if you'll call it that, back to his house. And so, like, I just followed Brandon back to his house. Um, and on the way back, he's, he's in front of me. He's, he's you know, brrr, along. And I'm, I'm driving his Tahoe behind him, and I call Brittany. And I'm, Brittany's my wife. And I'm like, hey, babe, um, remember that favor I told you about that Brandon needed? And she was like, yeah. And I was like, hey, he just bought a scooter. And she was like, really? And I was like, yeah. And so, like, we're sitting here talking about this scooter, and I'm just like, you know, Brittany, this is just kind of weird. Like, it's Colorado. It snows a lot. Like, how is he going to drive this thing in the snow? And she's like, I don't know. You know, you're a good friend. And she's just trying to encourage me because I'm like, this is the weirdest errand I've ever been on. And so, like, I just follow him back to his house. And I just keep thinking to myself, like, I don't know. I don't think scooters are for me. And I'm not real sure if Brandon's for me now either. You know what I mean? Like, this is kind of strange. So, but hold on. Hold on, guys. It gets better. So then we get back to Brandon's house, and he shows it to Natalie. Natalie takes it for a little spin. And then he hands me the keys, and he's like, hey, man, do you want to drive it? And I'm like, you know, I don't want to be rude. So I'm like, yeah, man, I'll drive it. And I get on there, and I start going. I'm telling you guys, that thing is like crack on two wheels. It is just like, it is incredible. I got, I got back to Brandon's house, and like I had just this, this like, just the most, most confusing emotions I've ever felt in my life. I like handed Brandon the keys and I get back in my car and I'm like calling Brittany and I'm like, hey babe, what's going on? And she was like, hey, did you get finished dropping off the scooter? And I was like, yeah. And she was like, you still think it's stupid? And I was like, well, I don't know. And so then like the whole drive back home, I was like, I wonder if I could get a scooter. <laughs> and so I, I, I get on Craigslist and I start looking up and I'm like, I wonder I wonder if there's a scooter for me out there with my name on it. And this was on a Saturday. Don't you know, by Monday morning, I had the exact same scooter. <laughs> Pastor Brandon's is green. Mine is red. Mario and Luigi. Guys, this is influence. This is weird influence. But this is influence. Influence is living your life in a certain way so that other people want to live like you. Influence is living your life in a certain way so that other people want to be like you. A spiritual leader is somebody who uses the platform of their life for God and then influences other people to live like they do Following God's word, following God's ways. Oftentimes, like I said earlier, you know, we make the platform of our life all about our job. We make the platform of our life all about our family. That's not a bad thing. You know what? But, but if we want to be spiritual leaders, we instead we give that platform to God and we choose to be influencers where he's put us. We choose to be influencers at work. We choose to be influencers with our family. We can be Deborahs. We can be leaders who lead if we will just give the platform of our life to God and influence people for God's word and for God's ways. Now, sometimes our leadership, sometimes our leadership is really more about our followership. You with me? Sometimes us being leaders is more about us being followers because as we see here next, followers follow. If leaders lead, then leaders who lead are also followers who follow. Look at what happens next in this story. Okay, uh, Deborah has already told Barak, hey, you're going to go do this. Other translations, by the way, say, has not the Lord your God commanded you go and do this? Okay, so like, this is like literally like, like the power of God speaking directly to Barak, go and do this. And he looks right back at Deborah and he says, I'm not going unless you go. God is speaking straight to Barak through Deborah. Deborah's leading, but Barak is not following. Barak says, I'm not going unless you go. All right, I'll go, she replied, but I'm warning you. 
but the Lord is going to let a woman defeat Sisera, and no one will honor you for winning the battle. Right? Deborah was a leader who would lead, but Barak was not a follower who would follow. If we're going to be leaders who lead, then we also need to be followers who follow. Following sometimes is really just something as simple as um, just, just simple obedience, right? Just simple obedience, right? Like Barak has conditional obedience, right? He's like, I'll go if you go with me. That's conditional obedience. Sometimes we practice delayed obedience. You know, God, I will do that later. I will do that later. I will do that next week. I will do that tomorrow. I will do that. Sometimes we kind of blend the two together, and we're like, you know what, God? I will do that whenever life calms down. I will do that whenever I feel like we have more money in the bank. I will do that whenever, um, you know, I, I'm not so just stressed out about work. I will do that later. Instead, what we see here, man, simple obedience. All God requires of us is simple obedience, right? Um, you guys seen that Shia LaBeouf video where he just screams, just do it, just do it. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Like Deborah's having this, this, this moment um, with, with Barack in the back of her mind. She's like, just do it. Just do it. Like, you know, other translations, like I said, it says, has not the Lord already gone ahead of you, right? He says, the Lord got your God has commanded you, and the Lord has already gone ahead of you. So, so Deborah, her, her, she's kind of like, Barak, just do it. Just, just do it. God's told you to do it. God's gone ahead of you to make it easy for you. Just, just get up there and do it, man. And Barak won't. If we want to be leaders who lead, we got to be followers who follow. And in order to be followers who follow, we just got to have this, 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 just this simple, you know, humble, real sense of just saying, you know what, God, yes, I'll do it. Because you told me, I'll do it. You know, earlier I told you that this story takes place pretty much just in chapter 4. It's all in chapter 4. That's where the battle is. That's where, you know, the, the, the meat of the story, if you will, takes place. Chapter 5 is, is the victory song all about this, right? So chapter 5 is the victory song all about this. And Deborah's singing this, this incredible song over the people of Israel. And she says here in verses 17 and 18, she says, Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan, right? These are the different tribes. Remember, he had to go and get Naphtali. He had to go and get Zebulun. And so Deborah now in chapter 5 is talking about, you know, the tribes, you know, kind of what happened. You know, you know, she's kind of recounting the story. She says, Gilead, they stayed beyond the Jordan. That is, they stayed home. Dan, why did he stay with the ships? Asher sat still. How would you like the story of your life to be you sat still? Asher sat still at the coast of the sea, staying by his landings. Now, Zebulun, Zebulun is a people who risked their lives to the death. Naphtali, too, on the heights of the field. You know what this is saying? Deborah's saying here, blessed are those who step up. Deborah's, Deborah's singing this incredible song, and she's talking about how Zebulun risked their lives. She's talking about how Naphtali was so, so you know, brave and courageous on the field of battle. And she's saying, blessed are those who step up. Blessed are those who followed God's leadership in their life. Do you want the story of your life to be that you stayed put, you stayed at home like Gilead, or that you stepped up? And notice what Deborah doesn't say. Notice what she doesn't say. She doesn't say, Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan, and when everybody else went off to war, Gilead went and, you know, plundered and pillaged the villages. Right? Another translation actually says about Dan, it says, Dan went and found temporary work, down by the shipyards. So Dan, you know, like, you know, Gilead just sort of stayed home, but Dan went and got like a second job, right? Dan went out and got like a second job. So, you know, certainly we could probably think, hey man, you know, at least Dan's, you know, kind of doing something, right? It also says that Asher just sat still on the coast of the sea. You know, these people didn't, they didn't do something bad. They just did nothing. I think a lot of us today, we're probably not at risk for doing something terrible with our lives, just, just doing nothing at all. You know, the interesting thing about this story is, it, it goes on to say in other places, it says, you know, the, the, the army of Israel is mustered up, and there's, there's 40,000 people there. There's 40,000 troops mustered there um, in, the, in the Israelite army camp, and it says there was not one sword to be found amongst all 40,000 men who were gathered. Not one sword to be found amongst 40,000 people. You know, what that means is, you know, the Israelites just weren't equipped. Israelites didn't have the weapons of war that they needed. Um, it, you know, if you just kind of digging into some of the context of this story, Jabin had 900 chariots. Um, chariots were the most technologically advanced piece of warfare around at that time. Um, this is like saying the opposing army had uh, 900 tanks, okay? A, a chariot was, was the, you know, kind of the, the ancient uh, equivalent of a tank, so, so the enemy has 900 tanks, and we 
amongst 40,000 men don't even have one sword. They weren't prepared. They weren't prepared. Maybe the reason why you feel like it's okay to just kind of shrug at the opportunities that God brings your way is because you feel like you're not prepared. You know, it also says that they had been oppressed for like 20 years. Maybe you feel like, well, this is just sort of the way life's always been. Why don't I just keep doing it like this? This is how life's always been. I won't respond to what God is calling me to do. I'll just sort of keep the status quo. Whether you feel unprepared, whether you feel like it's scary, whether you feel like it's just something else um, in your life, I want to tell you today, it has nothing to do with your ability. God's work in our life has nothing to do with our ability, but instead our availability. These tribes that went off to war, they made themselves available. They made themselves useful for God. And that's why God used them to overthrow the enemy, right? Um, look at some of the other judges in the, in the, in the Bible. Samson um, had his eyes gouged out. He was chained up. He had been whipped. He had humiliated. And yet he's chained to these two giant pillars um, in the Philistine camp. And he made himself available to God. He couldn't see anything. All he could do was just kind of feel around in the dark. He felt where he was, and he said, God, just, just use me one last time. And then that was the mightiest thing Samson ever did was when he finally made himself available. Gideon, we talked about Gideon before. Gideon was the, the uh, he was like the weakest in his family. His family was like um, the, the, the least out of their whole tribe, and their tribe was like the smallest out of like the nation of Israel. Like Gideon would have not even, like Gideon was such a loser, he wouldn't even have the guts to go try to play dodgeball and get picked last because he would have just, you know, he, he would have been like the water boy for the guy who got picked last on the dodgeball team, okay? Like, but you know what? Gideon made himself available. He still went and did it anyway. Gideon didn't have the ability, but he did it anyway. And through his availability, God used him to overthrow the Midianites. If you're waiting for God to do something just incredible in your life, and the reason why you feel like it's okay not to follow him is because you feel like you're not able. I want you to know something. You're not able, but God is. God is able to deliver you, right? Look at, look at how the story kind of, um, uh, look, look at what's, what Deborah celebrates. First of all, she says, Israel leaders took charge and the people gladly followed. Let's unpack that. The leaders led and the people followed. Praise the Lord. Imagine that. When we do what only we can do, God will do what only God can do. Look at how the story kind of finishes up. Uh, we've got verses 15 and 23. It says, at Barak's advance. I want you to underline that, that, that phrase in your Bible, if that's your translation. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword. And Sisera, the commander of the army, got down from his tank, his chariot, and fled on foot. On that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, before the Israelites. Look at that. At Barak's what? At Barak's advance. When Barak finally did what he, only he could do, follow his orders and lead the people of Israel, then the Lord routed the enemy in front of them. I love that word routed. It's a great Bible word. You know what routed means? It literally means freaked them out. The Lord freaked them out. The Lord freaked them out that this commander who had 900 tanks at his disposal got down out of his tank and decided it was safer to run away on foot. This is what God does when we make ourselves available to him. Okay, God does not accomplish his work in this world because of anything we can do, but because of everything he can do when we make ourselves available to him. Faith, a lot of times, um, is, is, is stepping up right? Stepping up, stepping out, saying, hey, God, I'll lead. Hey, God, I'll follow. Hey, God, I'll do what you need me to do, and you will deliver the results. You will deliver the results. Faith is stepping up and having enough uh, faith, having enough trust to lead or to follow as God tells us, and understanding that he is in control and he will deliver, right? Now, when I talk about God is in control, I don't mean like, you know, it, you know it's, it's like a, you know, a game of chess, and um, if a piece goes flying off the board, God can catch it and just kind of put it back up. I don't mean, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that God is in control, that he can, you know, kind of catch the, the pieces that go out of bounds and keep the ball in play. No, um, God is like, a, like an incredible chess master. God is like this, this loving, this good, this all-powerful, all-knowing chess master, and he is able to think an infinite number of moves ahead of us so that no matter what we do, he can still lead us to his outcome. You know, Romans 8, 28 says, I love this. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose of them, for them. What does that mean? 
God will cause every little piece of your life, every little disparate moment, every little hurt, every little frustration, every little time that the plan did not go according to plan, every single time that you ran out of plan B, C, D, all the way through the alphabet, you ran out of letters, God will still work it together. If what? For those who are called according to his purpose. That is, for those who step up and respond and follow God's leadership in their life. So I want to give you a moment. I want you to look at the title on your outline there. You know what it says? Delivery in 30 minutes or less. Look at that. We've got five minutes, guys. This is your moment for delivery. This is your moment for delivery. This is your moment to step up and lead. This is your moment to say, you know what, God, I'm going to follow you. This is your moment to stop shrugging at the opportunities. This is your moment to stop putting conditions on God's call for your life. This is your moment to start using the platform that God has given you to influence other people. This is your moment to become the Deborah of your life instead of the Barack. So I want to give you just a moment. I want, let's just, we're going to get quiet. And I want you just to, to, to take an honest look at your life. You bow your head, close your eyes, do whatever you need to do, stare at the floor. But I want you to get, just get, you know, real in your soul. And ask yourself, Am I a leader who leads? Am I a follower who follows? Or am I, am I still waiting on God's deliverance to show up? 